What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Burnout Brighter podcast. This is episode 73. My name is Matt. I'll be your host for this evening's events. I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Darren. Hello. Damn it. I really thought you were going to give me a Destiny-style hey, 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 but Oh, no. shoot. Miss opportunity. Let's do that again. Oh, wow. Lovely co-host, Darren. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. There we go. And this week, we are super, super excited to be joined by the dawn of Stadia, coming from awesomely (laughs) average and speak of Stadia, the man, the legend, the Stadia king, Mr. Aaron Cini. Is this not the episode where we're doing Winnie the Pooh voices? What the hell? Oh, damn it. <laughs> damn it. Boy, I forgot Darren. for having me. Uh, I really appreciated Darren's Eeyore last week, so I just you know, thought I'd get that in there. I appreciate it. <laughs> I can't do it when you have Pooh voice, so I don't know why I suggested that. Like any other <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a very, very dark rabbit hole. Huh, rabbit hole? Get it? Winnie the Pooh? Uh, oh, if we go nice. down that way. Um but like, yeah, we don't have Destiny on this week, so we can't really do it without that sensual little piglet, which I mean, sounds like a nickname, but it's not. <laughs> sensual is, a, is definitely a description word. Right? I, mean, <laughs> I would not want to associate with piglet either. <laughs> I mean, you don't know. Oh, Going back geez. and watching the Winnie Pooh, man. Dark times. Oh, God. Man, when you okay. invited me on, I listened to a couple episodes. I knew I was in for a good time, but I didn't know we were just going to dive straight into sensual piglet. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> Yeah, we uh we decided to knock the door right off the hinges and uh, invite the honeypot straight in. Uh, this is what happens when Destiny's not here. It just gets <laughs> just ruined. Yeah, we oh, tend to man. go off the rails much more quickly when Destiny's around. I don't know if that's just because we're scared. Um, <laughs> at least I, you know, I'll get hit for things later for things I say on the show. So uh, I I got to be careful. Um, yeah, she will listen to the episode whether she's here or not. Yeah, exactly. That's true. So, I mean, sure. Well, I'm screwed no matter what. It's too late. <laughs> so uh, you might as well just go for it. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Aaron, uh, where yeah. are you from? What do you do? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am in digital marketing out in Colorado. Uh, I'm a Colorado native, been here my whole life. Uh, me and my wife bounced around for a little bit as a, as she was a travel nurse, went out to California and things like that. But honestly, home just called us back. So, uh, yeah, we're in Northern Colorado and I, I run digital marketing for a bunch of small businesses. That's awesome, man. And you also host two different podcasts. Tell us a little bit about them. Yeah. So, um, I've been doing speaking of stadia for about, um, I guess not quite a year. We started it last spring. Uh, and that one is literally just exactly how it sounds. We speak about Stadia. We just talk about the cloud for me, uh, cloud gaming services, what's coming up, any news items, things like that. And then just this month, I started Awesomely Average. Uh, it's one that I've kind of had in mind for about a year now. Um, and what it essentially is, it's, it's a live talk show every single Tuesday where I have on different content creators. Uh, and I ask them about how they got started. Um, what are their plans for the next year and kind of what their future goals are. And then we also really try to focus on inspiring other people who maybe want to be content creators who have never done it. Um, so we'll kind of do like some inspiring type stuff of, you know, what are tips to get started? What are ways to dive in? Um, yeah. And just get them connected with whatever it is. And when I say content creators, I don't necessarily mean podcasters. We talk to podcasters, Twitch streamers, um, like anybody like musicians. I have some musicians lined up. Uh, we have artists lined up. So yeah, if people are out there just creating things and you want to know more about it, let's do it. Um, you guys will be That's, the first to know. I'm in talks with like one of the writers of Brooklyn Nine Nine to possibly come ooh, in. And no way! I started on uh, screenwriting. That's super That's cool, fantastic. man. Thanks. Yeah, I super love what you're doing, uh, especially with Awesomely Average, just because it's such a positive environment. And like you said, there, I, I feel like getting into content creation is more of a mental barrier than it is anything else. Hundred uh, percent. So I'm I'm super super stoked that you're shining such a positive light and kind of you know giving people the tools to start if that's something that they're interested in. So kudos, man. That's it's what Thank you're doing. You. is really, really cool. You know, the internet's just such a dark, shitty place. Uh, we need more positive stuff. So that's kind of the, the goal and purpose behind it for sure. Agreed. And if people wanted to watch, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, so it's twitch.tv slash awesomely average gaming. Uh, whoever you are who has twitch.tv slash awesomely average and you have no videos and you have no followers, give me that URL. We'll come <laughs> find you. We'll come um, <laughs> That got dark real quick. Uh, yeah, so it's awesome. The average gaming. Um, 
again, we're live every Tuesday. The time does fluctuate, so you can always find me on Twitter at AwesomelyAVG because Awesomely Average is way too long. Um, <laughs> and I'll usually put the show times up there. Um, but yeah, it is always every Tuesday, though, to be sure. Awesome. Awesome, man. That's so, so cool. And yeah, everybody go check them out. They're doing some really, really cool, really positive stuff. And like Aaron said, with the internet being kind of a shithole sometimes, it's it's nice to find a bright spot. And when yeah. you do, support it. We are going to start, as always, with some random questions. And I'm going to be asking Aaron a question. Love it. And if I were to ask Aaron a question, it might sound a little bit something like this. Aaron, if you had to make winter wear, you know, for being from Colorado, I guess mm-hmm. probably gets pretty cold, yes. right? If you had to make winter wear styled after a video game character, what kind of clothes would you make and which character would it be styled on? I would make everyone wear Sonic onesies. <laughs> oh my God. Full fur blue you don't get knuckles you don't get tails sorry i know they're great characters but no you all have to wear uniform sonic furry onesies i think you've just increased our subscriber count tenfold (laughs) from a specific demographic (laughs) and literally as you slide your hands into the arms the gloves would be attached so you know that is perfect yeah Especially when it gets that cold, you got to have those those nice white gloves. And I'm assuming mm-hmm. they would have like little red booties also. Exactly. And they'd be snow boots, not shoes, but they would look huge like snow boots do. So you would literally just slip in to a fully ready to go Sonic onesie. You have the hood. It would be it would be perfect. It would cover have you entirely. You, been- you wouldn't have to put on 15 layers. <laughs> have you been thinking about this answer for a while? Because you came up with this very quickly. I was literally about to say i feel like we might have just gotten a bit of insight into a future business endeavor here and i I feel (laughs) like you had that ready that that was that was ready to go thank you um it was not uh (laughs) random fact about me i am i love improv type stuff nice Uh, and that did absolutely just come straight off the head but now (laughs) i'm kind of thinking about you know maybe opening a netsy we'll see yeah you know forget podcasting Right. Sonic one <laughs> just sell one specific product and people are I know people are going to email me and they're going to be like oh god I love the I love the Sonic but like could I maybe get a tails I'm going to be like no this is what I sell so. <laughs> I, I I would like to just you know throw it out there if you ever were to kind of go for a second character I think you got to go for Big the Cat uh, right. so, so there's a Big the Cat plug uh, I feel like I should be doing those more often um, <laughs> Big the Cat if you're open to a second onesie I love that uh, yeah. Aaron, now it's your turn, as we do whenever we have a guest on. We like to throw our guests under the bus by asking them to ask us random questions without much prompting whatsoever. So, Aaron, who would you like to start with and what would you like to ask? Uh, I'm going to start with Matt. Matt, okay. if you could be any species in the Star Wars universe other than human, what would it be and why? See, uh, I, I feel like this question has been kind of ruined for me by uh, Mr. Uh, Big Old Greg Miller. Oh, um, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know exactly where yeah, I'm going yeah. with this. Goddamn I water. Can't, I can't think of fucking Star Wars anymore without him going, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I think I would like to be whatever species Watto is, um, just so I could try and get to know the guy a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, I feel yeah, like he's a little wary like of basically. outsiders. Yeah. I feel like, you know, he's his guard he's is probably hurt in the past. I'm saying, right? Like, you can see it in his eyes. Yeah. Those eyes aren't like, just for... From someone the who fucks The thing you light up at is one of the slaves you used to own. It's not a good life. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he, exactly. So I, I think if I was going to be anybody from Star Wars, I'd like to be a Watto. And I don't really okay. care what their species is called. Uh, that's just what I'm going to run with. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be You're a Watto. the Watto species. Yeah, the I'd Watto be a Watto. Species. <laughs> just a Watto. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Darren, if you could have any enhancement cyberpunk style what would it be uh, no glitches and no breaking bugs just yeah. just the cyberpunk enhancement yeah because i was i really wanted to just be able to t-pose and assert my dominance <laughs> wherever wherever I, I went i wanted the ability for my pants to disappear at any given moment <laughs> it's, it's not my fault you're just gone it just happens i i, I swear Please stop arresting me for this i've told you yeah. it's a medical diagnosis leave the mcdonald's premise immediately <laughs> 
I have uh, what they call <laughs> CD Project Red. <laughs> <laughs> please email uh, them they'll give you a refund for your time and and for my pants <laughs> oh man um definitely just increased strength so okay. that i could at any time i need to lift anything i i basically just would be fit all the time i don't exercise i will probably never exercise my whole life uh <laughs> and uh Hey, you know, you just got to know yourself. Yeah, exactly. And so if I could just instill that strength in me right now and just stay fit automatically for the rest of my life, I think many more cheeseburgers would be enjoyed. Man, that's a really practical answer. I would make that so much more shallow. I'd be like, give me robotic six-pack abs so I just look good. <laughs> I like, Does it do anything for you? No. <laughs> but I look better. <laughs> I want knife hands. <laughs> See, uh, I was gonna Darren, go for knife hands, but then I'm like, I can't do anything legal with my knife hands. Hey, I would just destroy so many pillows in my sleep. You can <laughs> cook the shit out of anything so much faster if you have knife hands. Oh, that's true. You just use them as skewers all the yeah. time. <laughs> but then you, <laughs> you get, your, so you get many marshmallows. You get the grease when it goes back into your hands. It'd be a pain to wash, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that would suck. Darren, the only way I'm going to accept your answer is if all this strength is concentrated in your eyelids. So whenever you want to do anything that requires any sort of strength, you would have to get up real close to it and just bat your eyes at it. <laughs> oh, man. I was picturing him like flexing his eyelids to make any other part work. <laughs> Why is he staring so intently? <laughs> Each lash is an individual arm. Now, as I described that... that, I know it's audio only, but I tried to actually flex my eyelids. I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad no. we're not. I'm glad we're not on video right now because I'd be looking really weird. And Darren, no, thank you for the nightmare it. idea of eyelash arms. That's not something I want to think about on Saturday morning. But here we Each are having their own individual hands at the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god! Well, Aaron, those were some great questions, and we got some uh, interesting answers out of them. So thank you so much for hitting yeah. us with those. And what I want to ask you next is I'm going to ask you about a game that matters to you. We we like to talk about mental health and we like to talk about games that have impacted us in some way, shape, or form, uh, whether it's a game that got us through a, a shitty moment in life or a game that's inspired you. Um, what is a game that matters to you? Um, I'm going to just default to probably my favorite game of all time. Uh, it's The Last of Us, the original. Nice. Um, nice. It is one that uh, it came out. My son was not quite a year. So Joel's like journey. First of all, I had a really cool experience. I wrote an essay for IGN and uh, I actually got to go to the London premiere of Holy the last crap. one. Yeah. That's awesome. That was really cool. So we got to like listen to Neil Druckmann and Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson talk about the game. Um, we They set the whole thing up like it was post-apocalyptic. Like if you wanted a snack, they had smashed open vending machines that you just reached into. and <laughs> stuff out of. That's wow. so cool. Yeah, so like that experience kind of had already kind of hyped me up, and I was a huge Naughty Dog fan at the time. Anyways, like I Uncharted was absolutely my favorite series, and uh, so I was just really excited to see what they were going to do next. But then to like fast forward to when the game actually launches and be a dad and like experience Joel's story, uh, it was just one that hit me really, really hard. And also, I'm not I'm not a repeat gamer at all. Um, the most I can say is I've played all the Uncharted games. I want to say like three times. Um, I have played through the last of us eight times wow. and for me that's incredible but it's because it's a story that like no matter what part of my life i'm in i relate to it for different reasons mm -hmm. uh and it hits me different kind of every single time and there's different scenes that hit me every single time uh and i'm being a big wuss and like tearing up even talking about it but it's just <laughs> one of those games that like no matter what it's gonna hit it's gonna hit home it's never yeah. not made me like ball my eyes out at some point yeah, a lot of what they do in that game is is super special and they just make you feel for every character that you come across. And I can only imagine, you know, having played it the first time when you were, you know, a, a new father, especially the first 30 minutes of the game must have left some some impact on you. Yeah, scarred the shit out of me, let me tell you. Like, <laughs> I was not expecting the game to start that way at all. I went in, like, I played a couple demo levels at the premiere thing that we got to go to, but they were all kind of, like, mid-game stuff. They did a really good job of not really showing you much story. Uh, so I, I went in fairly blind in that sense, and, man, that opening wrecked me. 
and from that moment on, it's it's always been just kind of one of my tops, or actually the top. Yeah, man. Uh, especially coming after something like Uncharted, uh, that was just you know out of nowhere, out of yeah. nowhere with the, everything. But yeah, well, thanks, man. Thank you for sharing that with us. Like, I uh, I'm super stoked to hear once we have you on the podcast in a little while later um, to to hear kind of how that game has come around because, like you said, it seems to be hitting you at different points in different ways. So yeah. it's nice to be yeah. able to come back to a game like that. Right. And it, it was also crazy. Like that's, I think what made last of us two so impactful. I know a lot of people have their issues with it and I just don't care. I have my own opinions on it. Um, I think that's what made that game also so impactful for me was I did get to come back to these characters after so many visits. And now I am like so much older and I have these different experiences and my kid is so much older. Um, and to like play through that experience again, also like really hit home for different reasons and different points. And I, I have only played that one once. I do want to go back through it again, but obviously my connection to that game comes through Joel mostly. So two mm-hmm. is a, it's a hard play. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. <seriously>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say anything more than that. Um, because I, it, that game is just, so, the, both of those games are just worth having an experience with because yeah, I, yeah, I'm not usually a repeat gamer either. Um, and the last of us is something that I tried to go back to actually with the, when the remastered edition came out and, uh, I started playing it and I was just kind of like, I don't want to, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, uh, yeah. like I kind of, I had my experience with this game. Um, but it's always something that I've thought about going back to. Um, and I, I'd like to think that I'll do like a one, two back to back one day. Mm. Um, Oof. but yeah, I've just thought that too. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm even mentally prepared for that. <laughs> yeah. That, that's uh, how I prepped. Uh, that's how I prepped for two. And it was it was a ride going from mm-hmm. uh, one straight to two, but it was actually nice because it helped me, uh, I think, appreciate the development between the games a little bit better. You can see the progression of how the characters got to the way the the points that they were uh, totally they reached in the second one. Nice. Well, thanks again, man. Though I'm, I'm glad yeah. to hear about a game that matters to you, uh, Darren. Let's throw to you next, Darren. What have you been playing lately? What's been going on? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I haven't been playing a lot. I've actually been quite busy. Um, as you could be listeners could probably tell I wasn't on the last episode of the podcast. Um, but, uh, my brother's been staying with me and I've been watching him play Hades. Nice. And, um, that game looks phenomenal. Um, I really want to play it after watching him play it, and I can see uh, why people gave it so many Game of the Year awards. The amount of content in this game is incredible, and the the artwork is amazing too. Um, I uh, except now I'm kind of scared. I've seen too much of it because I kind of know what's been going on. Um, but for uh, people like me that aren't really into roguelikes that much. To be honest, um, it looks like a nice, easy introduction into the series because there's quite a lot of stuff that you can get that counts as like permanent upgrades to keep the runs fresher. And uh, okay. somehow, I don't know how the hell they were able to record this many lines of dialogue. But every time you die, every time you talk to a character, you're doing like 30 runs and nobody re- repeats dialogue once. That's I, crazy. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's insane how much dialogue they've recorded for this game. Has uh, has he finished the game at all yet? Like, has he completed any runs? I think he's he's completed, like, seven runs now. Uh, or, like, actually, like, could beat the game seven times. I think he's getting closer to the actual ending. Yeah, um, from, what, but... from what I heard, like, ten is kind of, like, the true ending. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it does sound like he's getting there. Yeah, dude, Hades is, is awesome. So many hot characters. The gameplay is fantastic. I think, you, I think you'd really enjoy it. Even seeing kind of what you've seen from him playing it, like once you get your hands on it, like it's, yeah. it's a different experience. Yeah, other than that, I just, I, I always get like self-conscious bringing it up so frequently because I've just been playing Final Fantasy 14 for, <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at like 500 hours now. Nicely um, done, man. Yeah, and I just finished uh, the Stormblood expansion. Um. And not as I, I'll just leave it as not as good as Heaven's Word, but still much much better uh, than the uh, base game. And I still want to keep playing. I don't know how, 
I, my wallet definitely dis- dislikes the fact that I've continued to play it, but uh, <laughs> I will continue to play it. What is the right. gameplay like in that? Is it turn-based or is it more of the 15 style? Well, it's an MMO. Right. It's, uh, have you have you played any like World of Warcraft or any MMOs before, Aaron? Man, not a lot. I did play World of Warcraft back in the day, but I will admit uh, I am very much of the Greg Miller TurboTax machine mindset. And typically, <laughs> like the only other MMO I've sank a ton of hours into is Destiny. Right, 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 right. Yeah, though the the gameplay, I'd say it's almost identical to World of Warcraft. Okay. Uh, like same kind of just like cool down casting system. Gotcha um but, but all real uh, time all real time yeah but they keep it fresh uh with tons of movement uh bosses and enemies are constantly basically planting puddles of attacks to avoid so you're like always moving around you're like learning mechanics uh some of these bosses like throw out weird stuff like one boss uh it drops like a puddle on the ground that you have to touch it so you turn tiny and then you stand in a sticky puddle and then it'll eat you and then you go inside the boss and start attacking it from the inside like bizarre crap so it, it's that sounds very final fantasy crash. though i like how, it is. i like the weirdness of it that's that's pretty awesome it are is. you playing that on pc or on a console uh ps4 yeah i'm playing on it okay and PS4. so it, it controls just fine with a controller because when you say like world of warcraft i feel like i have to figure out like where the hell the aswd key is and yeah kind of <laughs> it's it's shocking how well it plays on a controller like i don't know oh, if i ever actually went into it a it. Chat. That's yeah awesome. and they just you basically just you hold the triggers and then all the face buttons turn into your different hotkeys and each trigger okay. is a different set of hotkeys nice. so like it works really well yeah That's yeah awesome. they've got they've gone a long way to make it very very controller friendly and like there's different sets that you can use and different button combinations you can use to key the different uh the different attacks and stuff so like depending on how you want to do it they've they've actually made it very very controller friendly yeah didn't mean to turn this into the final fantasy podcast but I'm the here one we are the questions i've been curious about it for a long time i've just never never actually asked so thank if you if you got sick of wow i think final fantasy is actually a fantastic uh like introduction because okay. it respects nice. your time a little bit better and you can kind of just stop whenever you want and come back to it whenever you want. Also has a fantastic story. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Matt. You got to play more with me. I will. I will. Uh, I'm probably going to leave it until I get back to Canada uh, just because this whole signing in and out thing that I need to do to get on to international service through Korea is just annoying. So I'll (laughs) I'll probably leave it until I'm back in Canada and then I'm going to probably get way too invested in that game again. Thanks. I want to go back to Canada. Uh, in two months. Wow. Yeah, my contract is up here at the end of February, so uh, I'll be back sometime in March. Nice. Yeah. What about you, Aaron? What have you been playing lately? Um, I have been playing some uh, Cyberpunk on Stadia because um, nice. it actually runs there. Um, <laughs> and runs incredibly well, which I know that's going to be a topic later, so I, I can gush on that later. Uh, <laughs> I've also, for the first time, jumped into the Hitman series. Nice. Um, right. The I, I played like Absolution back in the day and the ones that got like a little bit more kind of actiony and you could you could run and gun if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um this is like my first foray into the very like stealth mindset, plan your moves, figure out the puzzle to get to the targets. Uh with three coming playing, out. Are you playing oh, three? Yeah. Is that the one that you're playing? Or are you playing No, I went back to one. One? Okay. Nice. <laughs> it, it's not like you're... the story is super, super invested, I guess. No. But it's good enough that I really want to play through one, two, and then three. Nice. Are you playing it on Stadia? Uh, I am. Yep. Yeah. Because that's free on Stadia, right? It was. Yeah, it was free on Pro. Yeah. So that just made the most sense, which is actually what got me to try it. Uh, and holy shit, I am having so much fun. And honestly, these games aren't even always my jam. Like I said, it was free on Stadia. So I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And now I am like full-blown addicted. Like As soon <laughs> as I get off of work, like that's what I want to be doing is trying to figure out missions and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I love water cooler moments. And I know that's kind of weird in, you know, the pandemic and all that, but I still use the phrase of like wanting to tell a story about a game. And the first time they gave me two targets in Hitman one, uh, I could not figure out the guy on the top floor. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I had the costume on that I could get close enough to him. I walked up, shot him in the head. Everybody went crazy. I ran, jumped out a window, dropped down to the next floor, found a waiter's outfit, changed 
everything calmed down and I'm just walking around again. And I have never felt so cool in my life. <laughs> That's what's so like, fantastic about those Hitman games is just like the emergent game. I'm going to get buzzwordy. The emergent gameplay yeah. uh, is uh, a- absolutely fantastic, though. Like stalking your prey and then yeah. trying to come up some way to like make it all work. Yeah. And then last night I got to one where you like gas chamber these people. Like you have to get them all out of the hotel room to go to the atrium because you're like, oh, I'm doing a like a pest spray down. And then you actually take the like the poison and you put it into the air vent and gas chamber that room and everybody oh, passes shit. out. And then I found like uh like an EMT outfit and I went to go like quote unquote check on my target, but when I leaned down, I just stuck a syringe in his neck and moved on. And I was like, <laughs> God, this game is cool. And it's it's so much like and not to knock Assassin's Creed. I think those games are really fun um, in their own right. But it's not like climb the building, dive on the guy, stab him, repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Fight the your way through. The amount of ways you can approach these levels is just mind blowing. Exactly. Because everything that you said is not the quote unquote intended way of doing these things. There are right. so many ways of doing these uh, assassinations. Yeah, one time I got so frustrated, I literally just chucked a proximity mine at him in the middle of the room and just walked away. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do here. And they it all like work. down at the bomb. Yeah, they blew up. But because I was in a costume, by the time everybody rushed to see what the explosion was, everyone in that room who would have known who I was was gone. And I just walked out. Can't yeah. be any witnesses if they're all dead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really need to go back to those games. Uh, I had a really fucking stupid moment playing that because I think it was when we got two Darren on PlayStation Plus. You and I one. jumped in. We actually of, got one on PlayStation Plus. We got one. Yeah, we kind of jumped in at the same time. And I was really enjoying it. But I'm one of those people that when it comes to that series, like I used to play like two and Blood Money back in the day. Um, oh, yeah. that like I try and do the whole thing with like without really setting off any alarms or getting noticed and like I'll restart the entire fucking level if I get seen I, I don't know oh. I don't know what it is about it but like I'm just like I want I want to be hiding um, and I got really frustrated with it because I kept losing and I kept dying and then Darren uh, informed me which I just never fucking bothered taking the time to press the pause button and taking a look you can save mid-mission uh, yeah, I just me. realized that last night and I felt like such a dumbass <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was like, damn it. Like, I could have been saving this entire time and actually enjoying my experience instead of getting frustrated. And He's I been just resetting the mission every single time he did something wrong, like erasing like a half hour of gameplay. <laughs> yeah. Literally for a week and a half. I mean, I'm not quite as like if I get caught at all, but like if there's certain things that go wrong, I'm like, well, fine. And I start the whole thing over to try to figure it out. And last night, is I randomly noticed the load button. And when I hit load, it was like your saves. And I was like, wait, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you for making thing? me feel a bit better about this. <laughs> yeah. So it absolutely changed the, like the next two hours as I was playing, I was like, okay, I hit a cool point and I just immediately save it. And I'd get a little bit further. I'm like, okay, now I got to save it. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Nice. Uh, have you oh, been man. playing anything else or has it been pretty much all Hitman all the time lately? Uh, it's been all Hitman or cyberpunk pretty much. Yeah. Nice. Um, Unless I actually, when it's me and the kid, uh, we've been playing super hot together. Oh, nice. that's so much fun too. Um, yeah, he's, it's weird. Cause he, he'll play it on stadia on my laptop and then I'll, uh, I'll cast it to the TV and play it on the Oculus. Right. Oh, oh, nice. oh. two totally different, like experiences with that game as I'm like freaking out playing in VR and he's rolling through levels. It's oh, uh, that that game in VR is one of one of if not like my favorite VR game. Like it's I consider it's, it's so the much fun. quintessential VR experience. Like I, I think it's the best way to introduce people to VR. Yeah, mm-hmm. not, I, I agree. Not emotion doesn't make them sick. It, it's that or Beat Saber, I would say. Yep, yeah, those are literally my, like my all two the motions. Motions. Sorry, Matt, you go. <laughs> uh, no, I was gonna say yeah, those are my actually my two go tos. But Darren, you were saying. Yeah, no, just any game that where all the motion is your motion is a perfect yes. example. And Super Hot is a full body experience. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my brother, he's he's older than me and uh, doesn't game nearly as much anymore and all this. But he came up a couple weeks ago 
um, with his girls. It was the day after Christmas to celebrate with my nieces and get to see them. And I was like, when the, all the kids went to bed, I was like, do you want to check out this VR thing? He's like, yeah. So I put him in super hot first and he's like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And then I was like, do you want to try beat saber? And he's like, yeah, I put him into beat saber. He played like, he failed one song twice. And he just, he pulls up the headset and he goes, Hey, fuck this. Put me back in that John wick game. <laughs> <laughs> and he played it for like an hour and a half. He just thought it was like the coolest thing. And, and it does. I mean, not only do you not get any type of motion sickness cause you are in so control of the motion you do feel really badass in that game when you're like catching guns and vr it also yeah. it also has that hook of like okay just just one more try like i see what i did yeah. wrong just, just give me one more and it's like an hour and a half blows by and you didn't you, you know you don't even realize it right yeah oh i know that nice. feeling all too just one more one more just, yeah just <laughs> one more go uh matt what are you even playing Wow, Darren, look at you getting faster with it. Um, I have been playing nothing but Yakuza Like a Dragon. Uh, I can't stop playing this fucking game. I'm now on chapter like 13, and I'm pretty sure there's 15 chapters. So I'm, I'm kind of getting towards the end. I hit that point where they're like, you know, things are probably going to keep going if you if you go past this point. Um, I just can't get over how good that game is and how many cool moments. And like, I'm not usually one that spends a lot of time doing like everything i can like i usually start a game like that where i'll do like clear every side quest do everything on the map and then usually i get to a certain point where i'm like all right i'm just gonna do a couple on the way uh i can't stop doing everything in that game like all the side quests all like the little mini missions that come across uh i came across like this battle tower i ran the entire thing in one go um i i can't stop playing it the, the combat is so satisfying the story is so so good the characters are wonderful and um, I'm I'm really excited to see the end. I'm also very sad that I'm getting there. Now, uh, uh, actually, Aaron, have you yep. played any Yakuza games? Uh, no, nope, not a single one in the series, if you can believe it. Uh, but you're familiar with the series, right? Yes. Oh yeah. Um, and one I've always wanted to play. It's just I don't know. It's just never ended up coming across my screen. Uh, it, it's it's I am the same. I haven't actually played any. I've just been living vicariously through Matt. <laughs> and Matt, I want to know now that you've played enough, like how do you feel about like a dragon compared to the rest of the series with its like different yeah. combat system? I'm curious about that too. Yeah. Cause I knew the combat system was supposed to be like wildly different. Yeah. They completely made this one into like a straight up JRPG, like turn-based um, active turn-based uh, you know, to a point, but yeah, they've, yeah. they've essentially changed it, but you know how, you know, the thing that surprises me the most is how true to itself it feels. Like, if you had told me that Yakuza had been turn-based from the beginning, i totally believe you. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, like, it, it it works really, really well. And I don't think it takes away anything from any of the other games. Like, I love, love, love Yakuza Zero, uh, Yakuza Zero and Kiwami. Um, and I'm going to be starting Kiwami 2 in a little bit. Um, and, like, the combat that it has there with kind of, like, just active fighting combat, I think feels immediately more satisfying just because of like you know mowing through like literally 10 enemies on the screen is, is so much fun um uh, obviously with the switching to turn-based it kind of uh slows it down a little bit just because like you're not going to be throwing 10 enemies at one time in a turn-based encounter right like it's just gonna it's just gonna slow it down too much right um but it works really really well and the thing that i do prefer with the turn-based switch is, are the bosses uh the bosses are still oh. tough like the, a couple of the bosses that i uh, i went up against today like I was, I made it with like, like barely scraping by. Um, but I found that with the kind of other, Yaku, like the other Yakuza games, the bosses, the difficulty spikes could be a bit much. Um, mm. And like, you really had to, for people who are into that kind of gameplay, where it's just like, you know, watch the opponent, what stance are you using? What stance is going to work well in this situation? Like, I kind of like to be more like, I want to beat the shit out of everybody and I want to do it my way. Like the bosses in the other Yakuza games demand your attention in a way that like I would, I would die a lot before I'd be like, all right, fuck fine. I'll pay attention. Um, <laughs> so I prefer the bosses in the JRPG setting, but I do miss the kind of like overall feel of just like, like I said, just mowing through mobs of enemies. Um, but right. I'm surprised with how well it works because it really stays true to the heart of the series. Uh, and like, I would not be upset if uh, the games kind of continue on in this JRPG way, uh, while also I would not be upset if it switched back to it's uh, the combat that it had before. 
Um, I think both actually work really, really well for him. Okay, that's man. cool. This is what I do as a guest. I just take over podcasts. So sorry. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> Let's do it. I want you to close your eyes, mm-hmm. clear your mind. Clear. The next Yakuza comes out. You sit down, controllers in your hand. You start playing. Which combat do you see? I think they're going to stay with the JRPG, and that's what I want. Um, okay. More so than the than the kind of brawler combat. I'm much more of an RPG guy myself. Like Persona is one of my, is my favorite game of all time. Um, so like I'm I'm a big JRPG guy. Um, oh. So like I I would enjoy it a lot more if they kept these systems because they've also added stuff like you know personality traits and you know like you have to foster the developments with characters and like foster your personality in different ways to be able to get closer to certain characters and stuff uh, which nice. the other games didn't really have. Um, so I so you feel a little bit more at home in this system. Yes 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 much nice. more so. Um, cool. And the other thing that I've been playing is I've actually dusted off the VR helmet and I've been playing a lot of Beat Saber lately. Um, nice. I've been trying to do at least like half an hour to 45 minutes every day is just to kind of like, you know, get active again. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I keep looking at ring fit and I'm going to go back to it, but I tweaked my knee a bit about a week and a half ago. So I Ooh. tried to do the running in place and my knee was not happy about it. Um, so I've been doing beat saber for about, like I said, half an hour to 45 minutes every day. And like, man, like you work up a sweat. That game is just yeah. so much fun and just it's going crazy, to- isn't it? Yeah, like back it's to back. the back. one more factor that we just talked about with uh, Super Hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's moments where you're just like, you know what, one more song. Yeah, and yeah. like I find I have those moments where I'm just like, okay, I'm done. And then I'll see a different song on the list and I'll be like, yeah. I think I can do one more. I think I got it. <laughs> um, um, what, do you mind if I ask, what difficulty level are you playing on? Expert. Nice. Wow, you're a master. And do you <laughs> yeah. have fail on? Pardon me? Do you have fail on? Like can uh, you I, fail turn, I turn it on and off depending on the song. Okay. Um, like when I'm using it more for like the exercise aspect, I'll leave it. I'll leave no fail on just because I don't want to fail out and then have to reload um, yeah. playing on PSVR. Like the load times are not long by any stretch of the imagination, but that kind of, you know, 10 to 15 second break between fail, load, get back into the song. Like, you know, I don't really want to slow down. Uh, but yeah. if I'm playing kind of just by myself and not whatever, I'll usually leave no fail off. Um, oh, nice just to kind of you know try and get familiar with the songs i've been like obsessed with the bts pack actually um (laughs) way too much fun uh so yeah i've been using it as my cardio too that's the only reason i asked because i realized i'm not great at beat saber so i i put it on hard and then i always make sure i turn fail off because i'm literally just at this point using it for exactly like you said which is hilarious about 30 to 45 minutes every afternoon just to work up a sweat yeah but expert is like too intimidating where i feel like i'm doing so bad that it's not worth it so i put it on hard where i know i can at least get like some combos going and but i i, I do the same thing i put it on no fail so i can actually get the heart raising yeah and yeah. also yeah. there's some to some, sometimes be like a wildly different difficulty even if you pick like even they all say expert but i found that like some expert songs are so much harder than other expert songs oh, yeah. yeah i know oh, yeah. that too just on hard there's ones that feel more like like a medium quote unquote song and I can get through it and I get some good combos and then I'll select another song and I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I actually said it's X for plus. Like what, what, what? Yeah. what <laughs> Seriously, like um, there's a couple songs there that like I, I would do on hard, like when I was trying to get back into it and I'd be like, all right, this, you know, I, I got this. I'll go to expert. I'd be like, what the hell did I just walk into? Like, I feel like I'm just getting ambushed by arrows flying at me constantly. Right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great, great, uh, experience. The only thing that's, it's driving me nuts right now is that just like, because just of the sweat and like the fact that, you know, the VR headset's now a couple of years old, it's shedding quite badly. Um, so like, I ha- like, I'll take it off and, you know, uh, Senna, my wife will look at me and she's like, you have black crap all over your face again. And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> what, what oh, can sorry. I do about it? I'm going to leave these here. <laughs> I'm going to leave these on all day now. Um, but yeah. Well, I'll, I'll lay my forehead off on your pillow. That's what it's all about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got this. Hold on. Uh, yeah. So that, that's, that's, what I've been up, that's what I've been up to. I'm really, really excited to get to the end of Yakuza. No, but, Matt. What? I lied. Why did you lie? I am a bad boy because I played other games, too, that I played on Stadia. There we yeah, go. You did. Attaboy. Yeah. yeah. So the whole reason that we brought Aaron on, besides him being a fucking badass dude, is because I've seen 
him plugging away at Assemble on Twitter, trying to get him to get onto Stadia. And <laughs> I think of Stadia and I did, my mind goes back to when it came out a year ago. And like, I, it's unaccessible in Korea right now. So I haven't been able to go hands on with it. But people have been kind of like, yeah, it works. And then I haven't heard a single thing since. It kind of seems like it just went away. And then Aaron, when you came across my timeline, you know, so passionately fighting for it, I knew we had to talk because can yeah. you please sell me on Stadia? What is it about the, the you know the the platform itself that uh, that you enjoy so much? Yeah, yeah. Um, because we we tend to have a lot of Twitter mutuals. Do you guys know Dad Beard uh, Dad Beard Nerds podcast? Yes, I've come across them. Yeah, so Anthony, uh, they had me on to literally do this. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's come the same on, thing. Pitch, pitch, pitch me. I want you to know that after that episode, Anthony, I sent him a premiere edition because I had an extra one from the Cyberpunk deal that I wasn't. It's just been sitting in the box for a couple weeks. The the guy is obsessed. So <laughs> just know what you're asking me to do right now. Google, uh, right. hire this man. <laughs> That's why I called you the Stadia Dawn, right? Like I've just I love I, it. Which oh god, what a new nickname. I'm I've I've been called many of things about like, you know, Stadia whatever, but Stadia Dawn I think is my favorite. I think it works. <laughs> it just it just fits you. I love it. Also, um Matt Assemble, you're a coward. I'm gonna say <laughs> that on every podcast I'm invited on until you try this shit. <laughs> Fucking coward. Okay. Man. Seriously, I just had to come get that out. <laughs> I never liked that guy. I don't I, I don't I even know. know. Why, why, why you invited him on here? <laughs> He's a wonderful human and has a great channel, but it's time. Um, okay, so Stadia. Uh, this very much comes from me being a dad on why I was so sold on trying this platform to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, because I could play anywhere. It, as I get older, uh, I can't justify taking up the quote-unquote family TV uh, to just play games. So the concept of being able to just toss it on my phone or play on my laptop or just kind of play on the go, um, that really intrigued me. And then I got it and I was like, holy shit, this doesn't just work. This works incredibly well. Uh, one of the very first games I played was the second Tomb Raider. Nice. Um, yeah, I had played the first one way back when it very first released, uh, loved it, and then just never got around a second one. It was free on Pro when Stadia launched. So I was like, cool, I'm going to check this out. Being able to literally be playing on the TV and then the kid is like, hey, can I watch this? And I go, yeah, sure. I don't have to do anything. I pause the game. I open up my laptop. I go to Stadia.com and there's Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I hit play and it pulls it from my TV to that screen in the exact moment I was in. And I was like... Mm -hmm right on uh and then i beat that game played a couple other things and then i closed my laptop and then i was just sad because <laughs> here is incredible technology with no library yeah and yeah. i'm like man these guys gotta figure this out but over the last year i have seen google continue to fight continue to flourish continue to add games they have so many games you can get for free on pro i've just kind of let my subscription keep going every single month i go in and i click claim on all those free games i've got to try out a ton of fun indies but now they're really starting to fire on all cylinders they're getting these big titles day one uh and while i've been a fan for much longer than this their biggest win came with cyberpunk mm -hmm. it was so broken everywhere Except yeah. PC, if you spent twenty five hundred dollars or more, probably exactly, yeah. yeah, and it worked on Stadia, really, really well. Uh, and so I've had a couple of friends um, around here who have like kind of always given me shit about Stadia, and like, uh, and they're all big Google fans, like they all have Android phones and stuff like that. But they're like, God, Google just really failed with this service, haven't they? I'm like, they had a bad launch, I get that, but this service is continuously improving all the time mm -hmm. and it was when they were both uh one guy got cyberpunk on ps4 the other one got it on xbox one um and they kind of started hearing some of the reports and everything i jumped into stadia no downloads no updates and it plays great day one and uh my buddy rob um he texts me the next day and he's like this looks like an xbox 360 game he's like <laughs> how did they screw this up so bad and I was like, wait, what? What do you mean they screwed it up? This is great. <laughs> and he's like, well, what are you playing? And I was like, Stadia. And he goes, wait, Stadia? What? Yeah. Like, yeah. 
And he's like, huh. And then I saw the report start flooding in the day that it dropped, right? Like, obviously, yeah. we didn't know before because they weren't sending out those review copies. And the same group chat with my buddy Rob is my friend Chris, and he was the one who got it on PS4. And I was like, Chris, do not start that game. I don't remember Sony's re- refund policy, but you need to try to get a refund before you even hit play. Yep. I was like, I am hearing reports that it is broken as fuck. And he was like, oh, no. So he finally got a hold of a Sony rep. And they were like, yeah, you never started it. Sure, we'll give you a one-time, like, exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before they had to do start doing, like, the wide rollouts. Yeah. And both of them picked it up on Stadia and have become diehard believers since. Uh, because so, the technology just works. Yeah, so that's what I was about to ask. The, so the promise of Stadia holds up, like, in terms of latency, in terms of, you know, the gra- uh, you know the graphic fidelity. Like, even though that you're playing kind of, you know, over an internet connection, and like it it holds up like it runs well you've had you well, haven't also, had issues i want to ask what is your if you don't mind me asking your kind of like internet, internet? Yeah. setup mm-hmm. and like yeah, what's yeah. your download speed and everything like that yeah and those are great questions um i will i will say i have really good internet speed but i will also counter that in a moment talking about my co-host jacob porter uh who's also kind of one of our vocal people in the stadia community and he again he's the co-host of speaking of stadia mm-hmm. he has 80 down and he had upgraded his internet before that stadia was still running just fine at 40 down okay oh nice okay cool so they asked for 30 down minimum is what they want you to be on um and we'll I get to this in a second fortunate. but i will vouch that that minimum is definitely required Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard if you're lower than that, it's not a good experience. Yeah. Um, or if at all, if you can even get it to load. Uh, I I am very fortunate. I have high speed internet where I'm at. So I actually have 400 down. Um, nice. And on those speeds, I can play Immortals on my TV wirelessly on my Chromecast. Uh, literally no problems. 4K. 60 frames locked wow that's awesome that, that's, that's incredible really, actually that's really really impressive uh, it's insane yeah darren you mm-hmm. are new to stadia right well we started yes. talking about aaron coming on and you're like all right i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna try stadia out How yeah i was like go? give i'm like before you book aaron i want you to tell me <laughs> when he's coming on so i know i have enough time to actually try stadia myself uh, Which that's awesome. No, no other podcast. This is like the literally the fourth time somebody has asked me to come on just to talk about Stadia. Which, if somebody's going to have a brand, goddamn, I'm glad it's this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no one has ever actually tried Stadia first. They're always like, "Well, now I'm going to go try it." So thank really? you. Really? Oh, well, you're yeah. welcome. I I pride myself in my research and dedication to this podcast. That is some serious journalistic integrity, Darren. Goddamn, <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> un, un, unfortunately, Not a good um, experience. I, I, my experience was a little mixed, but I, you know exactly where I'm going to go with this. My download speed is 25 megabits per second download. Oh, so just right. under that threshold, where with 30 is where they want threshold. you to be. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. A little, a little fact about Canada. I'll teach you some Canadian history right now, Aaron. We have yeah. some of like the worst internet for like a first world country. Like we have a very predatory um, like ISP system. Uh, I I know okay. the US is ISP system pretty predatory in different ways, uh, <laughs> but we have I, I know about AT and T and all that shit. Um, yeah, tell me more about how Canada sucks with your awesome healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. I also, so uh, basically like our ISPs are all Canadian companies that have rigged the market so we can't have competition. So they just charge obscene prices and don't give a very good service. Um, But I also live in a very bad area. So my internet, even I've tried to upgrade it to fiber optics and it still doesn't go above 25 megabits per second. So some areas in Canada, I think will have similar situations to me. But at 25, it did run. It did yeah. run. Um, and the thing that I was most impressed about was even at 25 megabits per second download speed, there was no c- 
controller input latency. Yeah. And I was shocked at that. So what controller were you using, Darren? I was using uh, my PS4 DualShock 4. I'm like, this is like bootleg backwater Stadia <laughs> setup. Like everything Google tells you to do, I have done the opposite. So, <laughs> like true stress test. Um, plugged so my DualShock you, 4. What? Do you need to be wired in? Uh that was really my question. I, I don't think you do, uh, but I've had trouble trying to play uh, games on my laptop before wirelessly with my DualShock. Okay, uh, okay. So just to be safe, I, I plugged it in. I mean, like I'm sitting in front of my laptop, so it's not that big of a deal. I think, and like you can get cheap Xbox controllers and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you are wired in through Ethernet, or were you just on Wi-Fi? I was on. I was on Wi-Fi as well. Uh, I would be really curious on what your what it'd be like if you used Ethernet. Not that it'd be. Actually, it might be night and day. You'd be surprised at how much just plugging in changes the game. Well, based on you like saying your 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 co-host friend being at like forty and having a good experience, like I think it actually would make a pretty significant difference. Um, yeah. But yeah, I thought my biggest issue was gonna like there's gonna be no way that they solved the input latency issue, and they it worked. Even the games that ran badly, input was not a problem. Um, I played Hitman. I played Hotline Miami. I played Super Hot, um, and I wanted to because I wanted to pick like games that were very active and different qualities of, of graphics. Yeah, Super Hot ran the best. Had no issues with Super Hot actually, uh, which is again shocking even, that I'm below the minimum. Yeah, even at 25 megabytes per second, there was no issue with graphics. There was no, no issues with yeah. anything whatsoever. It ran well. That's Hot, awesome. Hotline Miami. I had a bit of a lag issue for input okay. just because that game's so quick. Um, right. But I think, again, maybe having better internet would solve that issue. Hitman was the most mixed experience. Uh, the okay. first level, for some reason, I think it ran really well. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it was... It, it. I also maxed out at about 720p. I wasn't getting higher than 720p. Um, uh, again, I'm below the minimum. Um, but at one point while I was playing, it started stuttering real hard. It dropped down to about 360p. Um, but I was still, I think, more impressed than I was disappointed because I went in knowing that my setup was probably not going to be. <laughs> I'll put it lightly and say it was it was a little unideal uh, for okay. <laughs> Stadia. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I, I like I can see why you're saying such kind things about it, because like you said, you go in, you don't have to update it. You don't have to uh, do anything. You just press play and it plays instantly and yep. great, like worked fine with the DualShock. I know if I had a better Internet, it would probably run better. And um, I guess... <laughs> I guess my lesson is uh, if a company tells you a minimum requirement, listen, <laughs> they that minimum it. requirement. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, first of all, it's awesome that you tried it. Um, did you, so did you go ahead and pay the 10 bucks and try pro? Uh, well, I, I got a free trial. I got a free trial, but Perfect. it was a pro trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. So the pro trials is how you got like Hotline Miami. You didn't yeah. have to pay for any of those games. Yeah, yeah. All those games. Yeah, all those games I got for free. Didn't get to pay for them. I didn't have to pay for them at all. And if I do pay for pro, like even if I stop paying for pro, I'm pretty sure I, I keep them. Uh, I think you actually do have to keep oh, them. Oh, I do have to pay. Them. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I that makes sense. I, they're not going to give away games for, like for complete yeah. free. Same uh, with PlayStation uh, PlayStation Plus, right? Yeah, you yeah have exactly. To keep it to keep things, things, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your like hard drive space like? How much of your hard drive space did you eat up with those three games? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think. Well, be, I think it, nothing. It I think zero, nothing, right? Because it's all three. <laughs> yeah, <isn't that> yeah. <laughs> I almost fell for that trick question for a second. I was like, hey, <laughs> how much space did I use? I, that's one of the biggest appeals to me right now. Um, I, I don't worry about hard drive space. I have Cyberpunk on Stadia, and it's taking up zero percent of my hard drive space because that's not a thing so um 
I'm I'm also guessing that because uh, you know, I mean, everything's launching through Stadia.com. You don't have to worry about anything like you know moving your saves around or anything, right? Like I'm sure wherever you log in from, that the game is just ready for you to go where you yep. left off. Yeah, it's completely cloud saved. Um, Ubisoft Plus, you can also save everything to your Ubisoft account now, and so you can jump into Assassin's Creed on your PS5 and then move over to Stadia if you want, um, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I did get into the Luna beta. Um, that's oh, nice. another thing that I will say I'm, I'm very passionate about Stadia, but it's also opened up my eyes. Um, I just truly believe cloud gaming is the future of video games. Um, people keep saying, no, physical media is going to stick around. No way. There's there's just no possible way we're going to head that direction. Um, you know what? People said the same thing about DVDs and Blu-rays. So it's just like, <laughs> get ready. It, streaming is going to become more and more prevalent. It just is. Um, <clears throat> whether that's next year, I don't think so. I, I am talking much longer, like yeah, five yeah. to 10 years from now. Um, but it's just where we're headed. So I've been following cloud streaming a lot since I got into Stadia. And <clears throat> I will say, the Luna beta was the absolute most atrocious experience I've had. Was uh, it? Luna yeah. is the Amazon streaming service, right? Yep. Okay. Um, and I, I will preface, they're, they're in beta. So, you know, take that for a little bit of a grain of salt. They are trying to figure out their tech. Um, I still don't quite understand how they fell <laughs> as hard on their face as they did when you have xCloud and GeForce now and Stadia to like really kind of work off of. Mm-hmm. But man, it was... 100% unplayable. That's how I got Ubisoft Plus the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I so I played uh, Immortals, uh, Phoenix Rising yep. on Luna and then moved over to Stadia. And Immortals was absolutely unplayable on Luna. Same device, same connection, same everything. Uh, really? That bad? Yeah. It, it just wouldn't run? Yeah, yeah. It was constantly freezing, stuttering, skips. Uh, tried Assassin's Creed, same thing. Texture popping like crazy. Like, just struggling to run a game um and then xcloud is the other one that i've played or game pass or whatever they call it now uh and that one is pretty solid um they obviously have a really good business model which i don't know how sustainable it is for microsoft in the long run Mm -hmm. Uh, but i love i love their business model i love the whole idea of 15 dollars. here's just a huge bunch of games jump in and play them yeah um it doesn't run the best it it's much better than luna but i would still say it's a good mile behind out of stadia yeah i think microsoft is trying to make up for it a bit with that on some platforms you're able to download it and they might be using that as a bit of a crutch right now yeah yeah i've uh i've played around with xcloud actually because that is available here um and i found that it was just very very dependent on where you were obviously like uh i because xcloud is, is streaming only um i was using it on my phone um going to work and stuff and even at work like it when it ran it ran really really well um but when it didn't it just flat out didn't like it was right it just unplayable did not yeah too. yeah um, which, same experiences which makes it more impressive that stadia actually seemed to even below minimum requirements work better than i was expecting it to to be yeah. honest that's um, actually really cool to hear um i haven't heard of anybody below the requirements really talk about it so that's kind of super encouraging have you I, tried playing around with it like on your phone when you were kind of out and about? Like, have you have you mm-hmm. tried? And how, how did that go? Oh, man. So I'm so invested in the stadium at this point. I have a Kishi, a Razer Kishi controller. Yeah, uh, I have one too. it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for anybody listening to this in the States, just so you know, Walmart right now is randomly selling it for $57 with wow. a set of Razer earbuds. That's Whoa. Dope. That's unreal. Like, That's I paid for a price from a Razer, so... That was crazy. Anyways, random plug. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I take the Kishi controller with me anywhere because uh, you know I have a Pixel Four, and yeah, I very rarely am I having issues. Like it's to the point where if it's not going to run Stadia, like Facebook is probably going to take a while to load. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm just in a bad area. Yeah, it's it's the internet. It's not anything that's wrong with Stadia itself. Yeah. So yep. you mentioned earlier uh, that you know you've kind of seen Google over the course of the last year. Um, you know, continue to work on it, continue to try, you know, kind of try and build its game base and and try and support it going forward. And I think I think that's one of my biggest things. I mean, like Google is notorious for kind of starting something and then stopping. Um, yeah. Are you at all worried about the future of Stadia or do you think that Google is kind of going to throw more behind it? And uh, and kind of if they are going to, what do you think they, they can do to kind of 
get back into the mainstream audience, right? Because I think that's the biggest thing right now is that I just don't hear anybody talking about it. Um, so like, do you think Google is going to stay with it? And if so, what do you think they need to do going forward? Yeah, for sure. And I get that question a lot, actually. Um, it's funny because sometimes I hear some of the same talking points kind of come up over and over about Stadia. And one of the biggest ones um, that, and this is absolutely no offense to you, Matt, mm-hmm. I think it's just become more of a repeated talking point of Google kills things. Yeah. <laughs> If you look at their history, they really don't. Um, okay. They do. I mean, don't get me wrong, but they do a <laughs> lot of rebranding. They they don't kill Google Music. They just call it YouTube Music. They don't kill Allo. They just try to improve their Android messaging service. They are just kind of constantly like meshing and moving and melding. Um, but with that said, I think it's still a very valid concern that Google at some point could just be like, nope. And then I don't have cyberpunk and I don't have all these games that I've paid for and I don't have this service anymore. Mm -hmm. What kind of quells those fears for me is people, a lot of people don't realize Google had this in development for five years before launch. So they've already kind of put in a really long time investment and money investment into it just to get it to go ready. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons they had a bad launch was they saw the writing on the wall that Microsoft was going to jump in and play. Amazon was going to jump in and play. And I think they just said, let's just be first to market. Um, and now, so you have five years of investment already. So that that tells me I have at least five years of them trying to get that time back. Right. And yeah. on top of that, they've now purchased two or three different studios. They do have exclusive titles coming. Supermassive is working on something for them. Um, Harmonix is working on something for them that are both going to be exclusives. And it just seems like they're making the right moves that tell me they're in this for the long haul. So that so then what is reassuring. Is, yeah, um, go ahead. So yeah, that, that is reassuring. And I guess that, that I, I had a question as well. Um, although you've kind of answered it and it's more of like a paranoid one. And I'm sure that you get this a lot too. Um, and, and it's a question of ownership. Um, sure. Because I am a paranoid person. Matt knows this about me. <laughs> I almost always buy my games physical over digital. Yeah. Uh, also because I'm a bit of a collector. So I like having a physical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to be transparent and say that Google has said uh, that with Stadia, um, Anything you buy on Stadia, like you bought Cyberpunk, you own it. Even if you stop playing, paying for Pro, you have mm-hmm. it. That is your game. Right. Um, but yeah, what if the servers go down? What sure. if what if Google does uh, just decide, like, at this point, it's not financially profitable for us anymore? Um, is that a worry you have? Or is that something that you just don't care about? Or is that like, wh- what do you say to people like me that uh, clutch their pearls and sure. <laughs> uh, want to hide in their closet away from uh, digital media. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, at this point, I think more and more physical media is becoming, um, I don't think we're thinking about it correctly anymore. I think we have a very old school mindset of like, as long as I have my DVD, I can watch it on a DVD player right. versus physical media now is becoming more and more like when you used to buy a PC disc, it wasn't really doing anything but quote unquote unlocking the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you still download it and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, at any point, couldn't Sony also just shut off a server? Like if CD project red went under, I guess you'd still have somewhat access to that game. You could still play the um, game in like a 1.0 state. Right. So I just think the further we get away from like that concept, and again, I I truly believe you're going to see even less and less of a disc mattering to anything where eventually it's going to just literally be the unlock key to prove that you bought it. Um, I see see a danger in that, not just from ownership, but just from like a artistic standpoint where it's like it, it, it's games becoming more product than art in the sense that yeah. I, again, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm doing too much pearl clutching, but um, those games. Yeah. Like you're not, you're not buying the game anymore. You are buying the license for the game. And yeah. at least with the yeah. physical disc, you've, yeah. you've hold a product in your hand. Yeah. Uh, it's, 
it's getting weird. It's getting dicey. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer to this one specifically. I don't, other than the fact that I just, again, I go back to that five-year investment. We're only in year one right now. I truly believe they have a road, a roadmap and knowing what they did in just a year, I can't imagine what they're going to do in the next four. And again, with studio investment and things like that, I think you're going to see everything kind of shift and change. So to me, it's less of a, I don't necessarily know if I have anything to combat the idea of like, what if Google shuts down the servers? Uh, my answer is like, man, I probably lost some money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Google I, will probably be around for a long time. It's Google. They've been yeah. around for, you know, they're one of the right. biggest, whatever the hell they are. Oh, my my Google my Google phone work. just woke up on me saying that. Um, uh, I yeah, I, I also that. think that, like, uh, Aaron, what you said about, you know, um, just literally buying the code. I mean, we see that more and more even with, you know, collector's editions now, right? Where a lot of yeah. collector's editions for games don't even come with the game anymore. They come with a piece of paper that you type in and then you download that that game, right? Yep. Um, I, I kind of – I'm with you on that point. I, I just – I I worried about a, a little bit more from just like a preservationist standpoint to be able to, you know, sure. look back and, and you look at the history of these games. Um, but – I, I think there's a lot of ways that they could combat that. Like, let, let's say that they do decide to turn things off tomorrow, right? Like, I mean, they could just let you download the game. They could also give you some sort of license to be able to get the game elsewhere. Because mm -hmm. that kind of mentality of like, oh, I have the DVD, I can watch it. Sure. But like, I mean, your DVD player isn't going to work in perpetuity either, right? Like exactly. that, that thing could break tomorrow and then you just have and a disc that you're staring at, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and to debunk know, myself as well, if they're making a game digitally on Stadia, you can still technically preserve it by ripping that file from somewhere and putting it on a hard drive. Uh, that exactly. would be yeah. against I, the rules of Stadia, but somebody could potentially do that to preserve it. Yeah. And like Matt said, I really don't think Google would ever just be like, hey, we got to close down. Sorry about all that stuff you bought. Yeah. I think they would be <laughs> in a lot of trouble and they would need to figure out like a solution around that. Yeah. Because um, we, like we, we haven't seen We that. talked about that earlier. Like, what if those servers go down? Can that's you still true. play the game? That's that's a good point. That's so you, then, you could not. So you've mentioned now a few times we're in year one. What do you see going year two, year three? Like, what do you think is going to happen in the future with Stadia? And like, what do you think Google needs to do to make it popular? Like, what what's next for them? Nice. Um, I will. I'll give you my like down to earth mm -hmm. where they're going, and then I'm going to give you my tinfoil hat. Um, I, 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 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the first one, um, I think they're going to continue to try to find studios. Um, I think they're going to try to keep pushing for exclusives. Um, one of the really big things that I think they found a lot of success in this year um, was one of two things. They gave away a premiere edition uh, with Cyberpunk. And a lot of people were like, I don't know if that's going to be enough to buy in. Between that and the news coming out that it was the best place to play Cyberpunk, they said you can get a free premiere edition if you buy Cyberpunk on Stadia while supplies last. That promo ran out five days early. Wow. Wow. People bought in. I mean, they were excited and ready. And they said, yeah, you know what? It's not working on my other console, so sure. And I've heard so many people that jumped in at that point. Another thing they did was they got uh, early demo rights to Immortals Phoenix Rising. And they said, you know what? You don't need anything. Sign up for Stadia. You don't need Pro. Come in and play four hours of Immortals Phoenix Rising. Use whatever controller you want. Go on any device you want. You're good to go. That also got a lot of people to finally check out the technology. So I think they'll kind of keep removing barrier to entry and making it easier and easier for people to just try it. And I think that's kind of become their motto. We just got to get people to try it. Uh, they also gave out Premiere Editions to anybody who had YouTube Premier, uh, YouTube Pro this year. Premium? YouTube Premium? I don't know. Uh, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> premium <laughs> it's not stadia so i don't give a shit yeah. <laughs> uh so that's that's why i sent one premiere edition out to the guy who had me on because i just i got one for youtube and that one they gave you a premiere edition for everyone on your family account holy so crap that's three sent to me and then incredible. they were like oh and if you bought cyberpunk here's another one so they were just giving them out like candy and i don't think they care about their little chromecast and their controller they just want people to try it yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think long term, the more subs they get, that's really what's going to make them viable. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of big moves like that where they're going to not necessarily get exclusive rights um, and piss off gamers. I think we've seen that with like Spider-Man earlier this year with Avengers. Mm -hmm. They're not going to try to gatekeep anything from you, but they're going to say, hey, doesn't this look cool? Why don't you come try it on Stadia first? And the more people are like, oh, shit, this works. 
the more people are going to start buying in, wanting to check it out. And so I think that's kind of their growth plan. Now, time for the tinfoil tin hat. hat. Get me hyped, man. Uh, I genuinely think what we're going to see in the future of video games is going to be a Netflix, HBO Max, Hulu, Disney Plus style model, where I think what we're going to see is right now Ubisoft is testing the waters on who has the best service for their platform. You can get Ubisoft Plus on Luna. You can get Ubisoft Plus on Stadia. I think they're watching those numbers really closely. And I think at some point in the future, you could absolutely see studios like Ubisoft say, we're now exclusive to Stadia. Wow. And then yeah. Xbox Game Pass, they're going to say, cool, Bethesda is exclusive to us. Yeah. And so you're no longer really caring about what your fucking plastic box is. You're just going to start subscribing to the channel that has the shows you want. Right. So, so I think that's where we're really headed with all of this. I you- am going to agree with that as well, actually, because I think it's been a strong pattern that the video game industry has taken a lot of points and thoughts from the way TV and film industries have done their things in the past. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I think what you're saying actually makes a lot of sense i don't think it's as tinfoily as you were implying fair do you okay well here's my other tinfoil hat for you i also think they gave a whole bunch of money to cd project red to push (laughs) that shit so that it would work on stadia (laughs) day and day one and they said here's all the money you need delay it right now from september and you launch with us on day one and cdpr said yeah okay because we right now the The game doesn't work anyway there we go there we go (laughs) <laughs> I love I it. Could totally see that. Um, so my last question before we kind of head to the news is: yeah. Do you see them continuing on with the model that they have now, where you pay for each game on top of playing for Pro, or do you see them maybe one day? Uh, and again, maybe maybe it'll it'll be a way to kind of get people in on it. Do you see them kind of going more the Game Pass route, where you know games like launch day and date, you can play them without paying anything extra, or do you think they'll continue on with the way that they're doing now, where you pay for Pro and then you buy the games on top of that? Yeah, so I just want to make it clear, and not that you misspoke, but there's just so much misconception about how Stadia works. Everybody's like, oh, I don't have a Chromecast and a controller. I don't have this. I don't have this. Even a guy on Twitter last night, I said something about, oh, you could play it on Stadia. And he's like, oh, I'll just wait till it's built into LG TVs later this year. What? Yeah. Like, so you want a $700 buy-in versus literally just plugging in your Gmail right now? And he's like, yeah. well, I don't want to buy a Chromecast and a Stadia controller. I'm like, but you don't need to. Mm-hmm. You don't need to do any of that. Um, I lost my yeah, train so sorry. Of thought. What, what I meant by buying it, I meant like you have to buy the actual game, right? Like Cyberpunk, you have to buy on Stadia, right? Or do you yes, see them kind of sure. going in that way where you sign up for Stadia and the library is there rather than, you know, signing up for Stadia and then buying the game on top of that kind of similar to the way that Game Pass does it, right? Because you don't have right. to. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to have Pro to buy games either. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, that was the thing I was going to get to. Sorry, I have ADD, so sometimes it just bounces all over the place. No, um, I think, uh, I hope, I hope we go to more of a just a subscription model, but I think there's a lot of licensing issues that we don't understand right now with Probably. Stadia. I don't think they were intentionally like, we have a pro service and you have to pay for games. I think like right now, nobody really has exclusive rights to say Cyberpunk. So you just kind of have to buy it, right? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I think eventually when we talk about that thing I was saying about the future where you're going to start seeing more of like a subscription channel type thing, uh, then yeah, I think they will eventually shift there. Until then, I think what it is is, hey, you can buy a game full price. You don't have to pay us monthly uh, and you can play it anywhere and it's going to run great. Or you can also add in this $10 value and we're going to give you a bunch of games for free and we're going to give you exclusive deals Um, because they also do run like pro sales that are only for pro members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that I mean that that makes a lot of sense. I w- I think I would like to see them head to more of the subscription model as well. Me too. Uh, I think that just fits more for what it is. And I think what you were saying about barrier of entry, I think that's the most important part. And yeah, and I I want to make it clear that like I am known to be very critical and harsh when it comes to a lot of things. Uh, but I I was impressed by how easy it was to get into stadia. Uh, yeah. Like you said, I like, I, like I said, I have a freaking like 
25 megabit per second download crappy laptop I plugged in my old DualShock and I was playing Stadia from subscription to loading the game within five minutes. Like yeah. starting brand new subscription, turning, like you said, you just plug in your Gmail and you go. And you're good. Going yeah. back to the good old days of plugging your cartridge into your Super <laughs> Nintendo or whatever. Blowing on it first. Out the game, it just worked. That is actually kind of what Stadia is like. Like you just turn it on and the game's there and it plays. Like there's no updates there's no like i think that is stadia's strongest point in my opinion and i think like yeah going towards that subscription uh, is a good idea and i will definitely be keeping an eye on uh where stadia goes in the future yeah. uh playing it made me much more interested um in in following the whole event uh it's it's pretty wild how well it works and i think you'll continue to see those kind of vast improvements how long it'll take them to get to a subscription-based model i don't know but even if you're a big ubisoft fan like i don't want to drop 60 bucks on valhalla so right now the fact that you don't have to have pro to do this Mm -hmm. you can plug in that same controller you can pay 15 bucks a month and play literally any ubisoft game you want and all the new ones are coming day day one that's fantastic Uh, so that is where you're going to start seeing that kind of game pass model where, you know, you pay 15 bucks, you're playing Far Cry 6 day one on Stadia, wherever you want. Stadia is not on live two. Stadia is actually. <laughs> it's legit. Uh, it's actually legit. Darren, yeah. do me a favor. Um, before the next time you come back on the show, uh, can you try running Ethernet and see how if it makes a massive difference? Absolutely. Yeah, not. I, I, I'm really sorry. I have to say right now, I don't have the capabilities to do it. Otherwise, I would have tried. I'm really oh, sorry. Okay. No, it's Fair. all good. Um, I will definitely then once I'm back in Canada, because like I said, it just doesn't work here right now. It's not available here. Uh, I'm sold, man. Like this, this sounds really, really promising. And like I said, after playing Cyberpunk on PlayStation 5 and running into bugs on top of bugs, like crashes into crash, uh, crashes upon crashes, I think Cyberpunk was kind of a real blessing in disguise for, for Stadia. Um, Cause I mean, it, it got people talking about it again. Uh, I and I, I'm definitely excited to give it a whirl once, once I'm, once I'm able to, because it, it sounds like kind of the promise that it was always intended to be. So, I mean, I'm really, really stoked to give it a try. Yeah. Greg Miller, like he's absolutely one of my favorite humans on the planet. And somebody actually asked him that on kind of funny games daily. Like, do they think this is the turning point? And he's like, no, I think it's too little too late. Um, I, <sighs> I think the proof was in how many people flocked just for that game because they wanted to play it so bad. And yeah. when you have just shapeless blobs like for NPCs walking <laughs> yeah. around on a freaking Xbox One X. It's insane. So I, I I think it was a bigger turning point than people give it credit for. And I, I think that we're kind of past the too little, too late mentality in video games. Like, I mean, you have games like totally. No Man's Sky. You have games like Final Fantasy XIV, which we keep coming back to, right? That, like, yeah. have completely turned it around after, you know, dismal launches. I, I, I think that it's never too late anymore uh, in yeah, this hell, space. Even, people, even Fallout 76, people are saying now, is a, a good game. And that's what I mean. It just takes word of mouth, and it, it, it takes the right know. game, and, you know... It, it might come back around, and I, I hope it does, because like I said, if, if the tech works, then I, I think they deserve an actual run at this, right? I mean, Google has plenty of money to be able to get into the gaming space in a way that you know opens that door, and like we keep coming back to this barrier of entry, right? If people can get yeah. in without worrying about what controller they have or you know what, what they need to have or whether somebody's using TV or not, I mean, why not get people more in? And I think that's been their biggest misstep, honestly. And it was one of the worst parts about their launch is I think there was a lot of confusion, right? People mm-hmm. thought they had to have a Chromecast. They thought they have to set, had to have a Stadia controller. They thought they had to have pro and buy games. They thought that was bullshit. Like there's there's so many like just little misconceptions out there about what this service really is. And right around October, um, I don't know what happened. It was radio silence from Google. Mm-hmm. Their social media was nothing more than a couple announcements here and there. If they had a Uplay coming up, you know, they might tweet about it. Uh, and then right around September, October, whether that was they knew like Cyberpunk was coming down the pipe or what, they have on fire social media. They're out there joking with people. They're commenting back to people all the time. They're having a lot of fun. Um, I've seen them even comment on like, uh, 
articles about what the download size of cyberpunk was going to be and it just like what's a download <laughs> like they're out there having a good time and they're changing their branding and then they started coming out with these cool commercials on youtube um where it was just super freaking simplistic it was just like hey here's video games do you want to play on your laptop do you want to play on your phone do you want to play on your tv cool we do all that shit you want it here you go early on it was like we stream 4k i mean kind of you have to have this much internet and also you you might want to have this connection and like the messaging just got so muddled so early yeah. on that now right, they're just yeah. trying to be very clear and concise. Get in, play wherever you want. It's easy. And I think that's going to that's gonna continue to be a big win. Unfortunately, they're just fighting an uphill battle, and that's on them. I mean, it was a shitty launch. I'll never not say that. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, then, I'm excited to see where Stadia goes, and I'm definitely going to keep in, you know, keep more of an eye on it. And uh, I'm excited to give it a whirl in a couple months. And to all of our listeners, yeah. if anybody's going to check it out, please let us know in the comments. Uh, you know, find us on Twitter and let us know what you guys think about Stadia. Let's mosey on to a couple pieces of news before we wrap. This first piece of news makes me very sad. Uh, this comes from IGN, by the way, of Adam Bankhurst. Adam writes, Activision merges Blizzard and Vicarious Visions. Adam, uh, sorry, Activision Blizzard has confirmed that Vicarious Visions, the, the developer between behind such titles as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 and Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, is officially being merged into Blizzard Entertainment. So basically what's happening now is is Activision Blizzard has went ahead and, you know, they've taken Vicarious Visions under their Blizzard umbrella, and now they're going to be working on Blizzard properties going forward. Uh, Jason Schreier has a really, really interesting article up. You can go find it over on Bloomberg, basically talking about how they've been absorbed to work on the Diablo 2 uh, remaster, which is rumored uh, after the dismal launch of Warcraft 3 Reforged. They're kind of bringing them in because, you know, they know their stuff around, you know, bringing games back and making them look great. Uh, and now they're going to be working on Blizzard properties in perpetuity going forward. That's going to be their new thing. Um, this makes me really sad as a huge Tony Hawk fan. Um, and I, I love what they did with that. And I was really hoping they were going to give it, you know, get a chance to kind of work on something new going forward, especially in that universe. It makes me really upset. Uh, Aaron, what are your thoughts on Vicarious going under Blizzard proper? Um, man, like my video game journey. I mean, it starts with like Mario and all that kind of stuff. But it like really, really started with me with Tony Hawk one and two. Yes. Like I I was obsessed with those games. Um so when I got the remake and the remake was so damn good and so well polished, like I was like, that's it. That's all the studio does for the rest of their lives. Right. They just yeah. keep bringing me Tony Hawk remakes. Just do them all over again. I'm good. And then when when you've tapped that well, please go find some other really awesome property that you can revive for me personally. Yeah. Uh, I can't bankroll that, but, you know, please. I'll <laughs> put in a call to Google and we'll get Tony Hawk on Stadia. The dawn of Stadia uh, deems it so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'll make them an uh, offer so they can't refuse. This really bums me out, especially with somebody who like I've played Diablo three and I think that's really fun, but I I don't actually have any nostalgia for Diablo two at all. So, it, this is heartbreaking. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, Darren, does this raise your hopes at all? I mean, I know you're you you know you're the kind of big Crash fan here, and and you were you enjoyed what they did with the Insane trilogy. Um, does this raise your hopes at all for what this rumored Diablo two could be? Or how do you, how do you feel about it? Well, I'll, I'll say that it actually it does raise my hopes that Diablo two remake will be better than Warcraft three remake, because um, Vicarious Visions are reforged. 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 I apologize. <laughs> uh, Did it have all the quotes from uh, Monty Python in the Reforged? Oh, I don't know. I wonder if you had to take those out for like licensing reasons or something like Maybe that. That's why everybody hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just think that like in general, what a terrible way to re reward such a good studio. They <laughs> revived crash. They revived Tony Hawk and their reward was to be assimilated into blizzard. <laughs> Go be support for Diablo two. Yeah, like, what the hell? Um, I mean, but yeah, I guess I have higher hopes that Diablo 2 will be better now, but like, Activision never ceases to frustrate me. Yeah, I'm I'm really disappointed with this, and I, I hope that, you know, this is something that some at least the team is excited about, right? Like, I mean, we can be disappointed, but the team over there, like, I hope they're stoked to be about working on, you know, Blizzard properties. Um, 
and I'm excited to see what they're going to do with Diablo 2. I mean, I was never really interested, but now with Vicarious on it, I'm, I'm more interested than I was before. So let's see what comes from that. The other piece of news that we're going to be talking about, which is, again, just a very confusing confusing piece of news uh, coming from Robert Anderson, also from IGN. Microsoft is increasing the price of Xbox Live Gold. A brand new post on Xbox Wire has unveiled plans to increase the cost of Xbox Live Gold, the online gaming service Microsoft has been using on Xbox platforms for over 18 years. As a result, Live Gold is going to jump up in price. However, if you're an existing uh, Live Gold 6 months or 12 month member, the contract price will renew at their old price uh, of $9.99 per month or $24.99 per month. If you do not fall into that, the new pricing is going to be a one-month membership will now cost $10.99, three months is $29.99, and six months is $59.99 USD. So if it's existing, so, it has changed. But if it, if you're new, then you have to pay this new price. I think it's going to uh, renew if you're... But like as again, if you're an existing six or 12 month, then you can renew at a per month or a, tw- or a three month at a reduced rate, but I don't know if this is going to be in perpetuity or if this is just like your next renewal. Uh, it doesn't seem like they've made that clear yet. Um, the thing that gets me about this is that like, and a lot of people were quick to point this out on Twitter. Like I like, they're obviously doing this to kind of try to funnel people towards, you know, game pass ultimate yeah, they want you on game pass for sure. Um, yeah. Which I mean, like I love game pass. I think it's a fantastic service. I think this is just a really, really scummy way to do it. Yeah, yeah, especially in the middle of the pandemic where a lot of people rely on these services to, to be connected to their family and their friends, right? Like whether it's playing together or even just using it as, as an opportunity to talk. I think it's just a really, really crappy way to to try and push that service. And uh, kind of like what you said, Aaron, earlier, uh, I don't I wonder how much of it is because they are putting so much on Game Pass day and date um, that maybe they're not seeing the returns that they want. So this is a way yeah. for them to try and, again, get just more people on the service to kind of balance out their spreadsheets uh, Aaron, what do you think? Um, it's shitty, especially I thought Microsoft did so much goodwill building in 2020. They did. Uh, they fought so hard to try to not have the same just embarrassing missteps they had against Sony at the launch of the Xbox One and PS4. Um, and it just seemed like they were doing so many things to go in the right direction. And not that that discounts all of that, but this definitely like – I don't know. It just kind of turned the old head of Microsoft, that kind of just gross businessy look. Right. Yeah. Um, I think they are just trying to force you to get on the game pass ultimate. Uh, they're really just trying to drive that away. Um, but it's shitty because you still have to have Xbox live gold. If you want to play like free to play online games, right? Like yep. Fortnite and things like that. Yep. Do you so really? now? It, it, yep. Now it's going to cost you if you want to sign up for a year at, you know, at 60 bucks for six months, it is going to cost you $120 a year to be able to play Fortnite or Call of Duty Warzone on Xbox. I thought that's literally twice the amount it would cost you to go on PlayStation. Yep. I well, that sure. and like you I, don't I even that, uh, gold. No, Darren, you didn't need gold. No, for free to play. Xbox is the only place that you need a live subs- uh, a gold subscription. Wow. So like PlayStation, actually, you don't even need to have Plus to be able to play something like Fortnite or Warzone. Um, so oh, you just, okay. yeah, you just download the game and you can play it. Um, free to play is, is that space where, you know, you don't even need to have an online, uh, account for uh, at least most of the games. Um, yeah. same thing with PC, right? I mean, all you have to do is download it and hop on, uh, Xbox will yeah. not be the only platform where you need to be paying for online to be able to access free to play games. That's ridiculous. Which, which is just horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, cause you know, like how many kids, you know, are still on Fortnite, right? Like it's still one of the most popular games in the world. And, I, I, you know, how many kids got an Xbox because of Fortnite? Like, right. They finally got an Xbox One S because their parents could afford it. And their parents, like, probably weren't super thrilled about shelling out that cash, anyways. And now when this starts going up, they're going to be like, Are you kidding? Sorry, kid. Yeah. Like, at $120 a year. And, like, even just like, you know, you know, for, for kids that are, you know, in a lower income bracket, you know, with the, because you there's, know, just no way. Well, there's just no way. And, like, that also, like, I think this is just like they didn't think this through because, I mean, that also comes at, like, you know, especially being a kid, like, you know, the shit that the kids are talking about is the most important thing, right? Like if you're, yeah. if you're out of that conversation at, you know, 10 or 12 years old, then I mean, like, it's going to feel like crap. And it's just because like, again, they're trying to funnel towards Game Pass, which again, great service, but like, this is just, I don't know, it leaves such a bad taste in my mouth. Like I was ready to pick up a new Xbox once I got back to Canada. And now it's kind of like, 
I don't know. I don't know. Like, I love Game Pass. I think they're doing a lot of right things here. But this, to me, just feels, like you said, Aaron, very old Xboxy, like very, like, you know. Just corporate money grubbers. Yeah. And especially yeah. after rumors, um, you know, towards the end of last year, I mean, Jeff Grubb was talking a lot about how uh, the current plan for Xbox Live Gold was to do away with it entirely, right? So uh, that online would be free on Xbox and you'd be paying for Game Pass. And they have gone so hard in the opposite direction where literally it is now 100% more expensive to play it on Xbox. Like this, yeah. this move just baffles me. I don't know, Darren, what do you think? I, I, you said it like on it. I I have nothing else to add to this. Uh, I think it's, I mean, ultimately the, ultimately the Xbox ultimate game pass <laughs> is a great deal for consumers. Um, I think Xbox Ultimate is a good deal, but um, just getting people to pay all like to screwing with their gold subscriptions to force them to pay it if they don't want to like there, there's no defending it. Uh, I think this was a big misstep. Uh, it's going to lose a bunch of goodwill that they've generated. Yeah. Yeah. And not to be like super hyperbolic, but like one of the reasons I'm so ingrained in the PlayStation camp was the first system I ever got was a PlayStation one. And then I was fortunate enough to get a PS two. Um, my brother was really heavily into Xbox. And so I definitely did have some Xbox time, um, where we had the original Xbox and played a lot of Morrowind and Halo and things like that. Uh, 360 stole me away for a little bit, but even then I had a PS three, these kids were in their parents, like I don't think they realize when these parents are like, no, you don't get to play Fortnite on Xbox anymore. And they finally, like a year from now at Christmas, convince their parents to get them a Switch or a PlayStation because they're games they can play. And they're like, but you don't even have to pay monthly. That's going to trigger it. And these kids were finally at that generation, right? Like, I'm sure you guys grew up playing video games like I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're finally at that generation where these kids are going to grow up and getting them into your ecosystem now for a long-term business venture is actually kind of crucial. Right? Yeah. Because it's going to have a trickle down effect that I don't think people realize. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think that's a really great point. I didn't think of, right? Like one of the major reasons I've stayed with PlayStation for so long is similarly to you, Aaron, like that was my first console. Right. And like, I've always stayed with them because, you know, that's, that's where I grew up playing. And, you know, outside right. of me agreeing what they were doing, it's, you know, that nostalgia is there. And, you know, it, it's wild, like you said, how many people are just like gaming now. Like I see a lot of the kids that I teach, like, you know, before I come to class, they're like literally like the entire group of like 10 kids are all huddled around each other playing Among Us together on their phones, right? Like coming into yeah. class. So like totally. if, if now for whatever reason, they're like, all right, I can't play Fortnite over there or I can't play this game or that game, then guess what, mom, I really want a PlayStation and mom and dad are going to think about why, but the kid is going to remember. And wow, that's, and a, that's really convincing. Hey, I don't, I don't need you to pay a monthly fee anymore. If you do this, parents are going to be like, yeah, okay, cool. I don't have to pay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. So yeah, let's get you the new thing. And yeah, so I, I think this is going to have longer lasting effects than they realize. And yeah, yeah it's I, just kind of crazy. I agree. Actually, just a few hours later after we recorded this episode, Xbox went ahead and took back all the changes that they made, realizing that they had made a mistake. They said that they were not going to be raising the price on Xbox Live Gold, and actually, they were going to be moving forward, and any free-to-play games on Xbox will no longer require Xbox Live Gold. So Xbox, good on you guys for listening, and way to make the change very quick. So thank you for doing that. And now, back to the show. And that, everyone, brings us to the end of the show. Aaron, thank you once again for joining us. It has been an absolute blast talking to you. And like you said, you've sold me on Stadia, so I'm definitely going to give it a roll in a couple months. And uh, thank you so thanks, much. thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, for anybody else, go ahead and check us out over at Burnout Brighter. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us at the Burnout Brighter podcast on Facebook. On Twitter, I am Burnout underscore Matt. You can find Destiny at dnbc32 aaron give it to us one more time if people wanted to hear more from you where could they find you uh you can always hit me up on twitter at aaron Sini. that's a-a-r-o-n-s-e-a-n-e-y all one word uh again every tuesday i am live on twitch.tv slash awesomely average gaming where i will be interviewing different content creators uh you can also follow um speaking of stadia on twitter at speak of stadia because speaking was just a little too long <laughs> awesome. thank you thank again, you so much aaron thanks guys appreciate it yeah go check him out he's doing a really awesome really positive content and that is just the thing the internet needs more of and that brings us to the finale darren is there anything left that you'd like to say i 
Um, I shouldn't have opened my mouth because I actually don't have anything to say. <laughs> Perfect. Aaron, what about you? Any last thoughts? Do you want to get off your chest before we round out? Um, I actually, just because you said the positivity thing, I'm going to plug one more thing. Um, yeah. There's a really great podcast out there. Sorry about my buddy Brent. It is literally just called Poptimistic. Uh, him and his buddy Anthony, every other week, release an episode. The entire point is to take something that the internet shits on and they shed a light on it and they talk about it in a positive light. That I just think sounds- it's like the most wholesome content and one of the most wholesome podcasts you can listen to. And it makes me laugh my ass off every single time. So Poptimistic, check it out. I will include that I in the show notes below. Sure. Yeah, that sounds like fantastic and a fucking awesome name. Wow. That sounds really, really good. I was really jealous. <laughs> yeah. Like, damn it, why didn't I think about that? <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely include that in the show notes below as well. So you guys can find them over there as well. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much. Please share this with everybody. We appreciate all the love and support that you guys give us. We are constantly working to try and get this to be bigger and better so we can talk to more people, more amazing people like Aaron, so that we can continue to grow and to shine a bit of a light on mental health and video games in this little world of ours. So, Darren, I'm going to ask you to say bye. Bye, bye, bye. Aaron, I'm going to ask you to say bye. Bye, bye, bye. We'll catch you guys next week. Peace out. dive straight into sensual piglet i'm i'm in